Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on. While a wave of Star Wars content has engulfed the pop culture world for the last few weeks, and while I'm not one to run with the pack, I'm occasionally one to surf the crest. Therefore, I give you a comparison long in the making. On the left, it's the Sith Lord, the Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch Dark Side of the Moon. And to the right, it's Jedi counterpart, the Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch White Side of the Moon. Functionally identical, technically identical, identical in every physical dimension save the straps. You could not find two watches that are more distinct in appearance and sensibility. I'm going to talk a little bit about what sets them apart. I'm going to talk briefly about how they're the same and then discuss perhaps who is most ideally suited to each watch and situations in which each watch might be better suited than the other. Let's start with the watch that came first the dark side of the moon. Now, of course, both of these watches have existing in-depth reviews on the channel, so I'm not gonna go too in-depth concerning mechanical specifics. And if you wanna see a wrist shot, I'll give you a quick one in each case, principally so you can see the difference in the watch's appearance rather than discuss ergonomics. Suffice to say, if you can wear the 42 millimeter steel moon watch, you can wear the 44.25 millimeter ceramic version because the ceramic version is lighter on the wrist than the smaller steel moon watch. Also, it's important to remember that the grandest dimension is probably the thickness. Both watches 16.4 millimeters thick. It's the outward cantilevered tachymetric scale bezel that's probably the limiting factor when wearing these with a tight cuff or formal sleeve. But neither watch is really the type to be hidden underneath a shirt cuff. If you need a formal watch that thin for an occasion where you absolutely can't let your watch be seen, perhaps a DeVille Trezor is the one for you. Now you can see that the watch has a 50 millimeter lug to lug span and that goes for the white side too. That's the most compact dimension and it's far less than you would suspect on a 44 plus millimeter watch, meaning that if your wrist is as small as 14 and a half centimeters in circumference, you can wear either watch easily. More on why that might be important in a moment. Now, you've seen the dark side, I'm gonna show you the white side. Again, this is purely for aesthetic impressions. They fit the same. The white side would be my choice. You can see that 50 millimeters across the wrist, I have plenty of clearance on both sides. It doesn't flare out and over. If your wrist is petite, if you're 14 and a half centimeters, even 14 perhaps, and you're wondering if this is possible, just think oval wrist, you can wear toward the lower end of that size spectrum. I think a good oval profiled wrist at 14 centimeters circumference could probably wear either of these. Now they're light on the wrist because of the ceramic, but they're not identical because the strap specification starts to diverge almost immediately. At the lugs, and for those of you who are sticklers about straps and aftermarket options, the lug spacing is 21 millimeters in each case. But let me bring the watch into better focus. Okay, that's better. Not perfect, but better. You can see that the straps could not be more different in appearance or composition. Textile on the top with the dark side, gloss alligator leather on the top with the white side. Now turn them over, same red contrasting stitch, same natural grained calfskin, but in different colors. This is where the real differences start. Okay, this is not a depth effect. You're actually looking at clasps of different sizes. The white side features a much smaller clasp body, although externally, their ceramic caps width and twin trigger are identical in every respect. They're functionally identical. In terms of size, this is where you begin to realize that Omega has intended the white side for more of a unisex audience, whereas the dark side is aimed more or less solely at men. The bigger clasp body is your first cue. Now, of course, they feature the minderless system in each case, so you can tuck excess strap length underneath with no need for minder loops on the straps. But you'll notice, and I'm gonna align the lugs here, I'm aligning the lugs and I'm drawing them out of view. The lugs are still aligned, but when I press both of these straps down, you can see that the white side not only has a smaller clasp body, but a smaller strap too. That means that larger wrists, if you're a man and you intend to wear this, larger wrists will probably require specifying a larger strap prior to taking delivery. And again, I'm lining up the lugs so you can see, and I'm keeping them aligned as I move them off screen. The lower portion of the strap 
is also smaller on the white side. So the strap is smaller on both sides and the clasp is smaller on the white side. So remember, again, if you're gonna wear this for use on a large masculine wrist, you may wanna ask a few questions about getting the right sized strap, measure your wrist in advance, know in advance, and be a happy customer. Okay, all of that said, there are many differences in terms of the look of each watch. I should first say that functionally they're, res they're the same in every respect except legibility, and that's where the dark side really does pull out an advantage. You can read the tack more easily. You can read the dial more easily. Neither one is an exercise in fatuous irony like the Hublot All Black series, but the contrast for indices, for white on black print, for hands, for sub-registers, it is better on the dark side. It's a more usable watch. Both of them feature 18 karat white gold for hands and indices. These are flagship products intended to compete almost one for one in terms of pricing and market point with the Rolex Daytona. These are $12,000 watches. The Daytona in steel is about $12,500. And again, because these don't feature integrated bracelets with solid end links, despite being larger than the Daytona, they wear about the same size on the wrist. Now let's talk a little bit about the white side. You should know that every gray side of the moon effectively starts as a white side. A second cooking process turns it that distinctive titanium gray color. But what you get here is the same material of the dark side, dimensionally identical. You even get the same finishes, although the satin finish of the case flank is tougher to read against an all-white background and white polish just above. But the bevel is polished, the case flank is satin, and the lip, the outer lip of the tachymetric scale, which you can actually see fairly well in terms of reflection, is all of high polish. Now yes, this is the more feminine of the two, at least in conventional terms, but it's not the most feminine white side of the moon. There is a diamond set bezel version that is far more directly geared toward a female audience. This is more of a unisex offering, but let's face it, there's no reason why a lady can't be a Sith Lord, and there's no reason why a guy can't dance to the white side. If you prefer the white side of the moon, then you're exactly like me. You want the less common and more distinctive watch. There are a lot of all black watches out there. So while the dark side was a sensation in 2013, even then it wasn't alone in the market. This is far more unusual. And I would say for every 20 dark sides you see, I'm not even sure that you see one white side. It's that special. And despite the fact that the strap is smaller, it would have no trouble fitting on a wrist, in my estimation, up to as large as 17 and a half centimeters circumference. So it's not as though it's on a mini strap. Now, mechanically, the watches are identical. We'll talk for a moment about the machines inside because this is the most important part for me, and I'm sure some of you may not be familiar with the watches. Remember, I have an individual review for each of these watches on the channel, so go reference those if you want to see more of the wrist impressions and perhaps hear more about the tech and spec. Now the watches both feature the Omega Coaxial Caliber 9300. It's the chronograph version of the 8500. It's a coaxial built from the plate up and exclusive to Omega. So you won't see it in a Longines, a Breguet, a Blancpain, a Harry Winston, or any of the other 17 Swatch brands that sell watches under their name. Now column wheel, which you can see through the skeletonized bridge, so a traditional function selector. And you can see on the white side that the column wheel circulates as you function or select functions and cycle between stop and start. And of course the bridges are full balance bridges anchored on both sides, not the cantilevered balance cock of something like a 2824 or 2892. In conjunction with the free sprung architecture, that makes them very shock resistant. Now the SI14 silicon hairspring means that the watch is effectively amagnetic, not anti-magnetic like Rolex's Milgauss or any of the watches with its parachrom blue alloy hairspring. This is amagnetic, basically immune. 60 hour power reserve via twin mainspring barrels. That means that the watch has solidly more than the the 38 to 42 hours of power reserve common for automatics. Still a little bit less than the Breitling B01 and the Rolex 4130 though that have 70 hours. Now the watch also features the tri-level coaxial escapement which is Omega's latest. It's very robust. It delivers on all of the original promises George Daniels made about short-term timing accuracy, long-term timing stability, and reduced maintenance needs over the life of the watch. Also important to note is that each watch 
and its caliber 9300 features a vertical clutch. A vertical clutch is an engagement mechanism that's actuated by the column wheel. That's the difference between the two of them. The vertical clutch engages the chronograph after being told to do so by the column wheel. And you can see there's no jump to the seconds hand when you start a vertical clutch chronograph and no stagger and no ambiguity as it always resets precisely to the index at 12. Plus, the vertical clutch means you can just leave it running and there's no additional wear or tear on the movement. The nice feature about both 8500 and 9300 is that you can jump time zones, advancing forward or backwards as you cross the international date line. You can do all of this with the time zone adjustment function, and note that the watch doesn't stop while it's engaged, so it doesn't affect the COSC certified chronometer status of the timepiece. In practical terms, jumping time zones doesn't affect the precision of your watch. A handsome piece in each case. Both of these watches are 50 meters water resistant, which means wading and surface ex exposure is okay. Splashes, rain, swimming on the surface perhaps. But I would not take either of these watches, nor would I take the original Moon Watch diving. Okay, who is the watch for? Let's talk about the dark side first. The dark side is in many ways the more conventional of the two watches. Even though it was a sensation when it came out, we'd seen all black watches before, dating back arguably to Panerai and Audemars Piguet during the 1990s. So the watch has a distinctive look. It's certainly unlike any other Moon Watch with the exception of the three other Dark Side of the Moons that were released in 2015. This is where the white side comes out ahead. The white side is less common, but the dark side, by most conventional measures, is more masculine. Also, if you're going to wear it with formal attire, an all-black watch naturally would make more sense than an all-white watch, and between the two, this is the one less likely to stick out like a red thumb in the office. You can be a Sith Lord and fly under the radar. You don't have to be the master, you can be the apprentice. That guy's usually waiting in the shadows. Okay, so where is this watch? best worn. Well, again, any formal environment, it's going to seem more natural than an all-white watch, but in general, this is one for northern climates, for colder places. This is one for financial centers like Frankfurt, London, New York, Chicago. It's for the office sensibility. It's for the formal sensibility. It's for the guy who wants a spectacular watch and a distinctive watch, but maybe isn't ready to get absolutely wild and outlandish. Now, the white side of the moon is absolutely that. This is a striking statement. You couldn't make a brasher, bolder, or more visible wrist statement with a solid gold watch. This thing is alien. Look at it against my baseboard. I'm sorry, I'm going to bring my polishing cloth back because you almost can't see the watch. I'm getting snow blind in my own viewfinder. It's distinctive. It's striking. Yeah, it's a little bit feminine, but you know what? There's a grace to femininity that is not exclusive to the female gender. This is something that any guy with a sense of panache and a brash confidence about himself could wear with great flair. This is a watch for southern climates. This is a watch for the Riviera. This is a watch for southern Europe. This is a watch for Miami Beach, for LA's Sunset Strip. This is a watch for summertime, wherever you may be. This is an impressive watch in many ways. And again, I would say you see one of these for every 20 plus dark sides that you encounter. So I'm not going to say that there's a right way or a wrong way to wear your watch. Perhaps you wear this to your sister's wedding. Hey, I probably would. But the bottom line is that the watches are incredibly distinct in appearance and character. And it's important to remember that if you're going to wear this one on a big wrist, it does come specced a little bit different than the dark side. Regardless of which side of the moon, or the force you select as your own. I wish you the best, wear your watches, in the best of health and good times. Sith Lords and Jedi unite, may the force be with you.